law of partial pressure is another gas law that just kind of makes sense. At constant volume, the total pressure exerted by a mixture of fluids is equal to sum of the pressures exerted by each individual fluid. Hmm. A mixture of fluids. Well, we should make note of one thing. Technically, a fluid could be a gas or a liquid. It's anything where the particles are free to flow. Uh, so gases obviously are fluid. I mean, often we think of liquids as being fluids, but a gas is fluid. The particles are free to flow and move. So this law really can refer to both or even a mixture of like gases and liquids or different gases and different liquids. The total pressure exerted by a mixture of fluids is equal to the sum of the pressure exerted by each individual fluid. Oh my gosh. So let's say I took gas number one, hydrogen, at a pressure of 2.9 atmospheres. And now again, remember the pressure is directly proportional to the number of particles, not necessarily the identity of the particle. So I've got this picture, like 0.6 moles of hydrogen. Or they're showing like what? One, two, three, four, five, six molecules. All right, 0.6 moles, pressure is 2.9 atmospheres. Then I have another container with some hydrogen. Whoopsie, helium. Second container is helium. Hello. 7.2 atmospheres of pressure. Because there's more particles. I mean, I can count them, but it says there's 1.5 moles. So there's a little bit more than twice as many particles. There's probably like a little over 12 particles. I'm not going to count them all, but it looks like there's a little more than 12. I don't know. Okay, so now I mix these gases together. So I mix the hydrogen and the helium, and what do you know? If I take hydrogen at 2.9 atmospheres, Plus helium at 7.2 atmospheres. Oh my goodness. The pressure is the sum of the individual pressures. 10.1 atmosphere. The total pressure is dependent on the total number of particles. Not the identity of the particles. So it didn't matter that one gas was hydrogen, one was helium. What mattered was the, the number of particles coming from each gas. I could have 2.1 moles of just straight up helium. As long as it's at the same temperature and, well, pressure. 2.1 moles of straight pure helium would have the same pressure as this mixture of hydrogen and helium. As long as they're the same number of particles. If you add the particles together, you can add the pressures. So, I mean, this equation is really not much of an equation at all. It's just that the total pressure is the sum of the pressure from gas one plus gas two plus gas three. These could be different gases. They could be like samples of the same gas. I have three samples of helium. There could be like two samples of gas and a sample of, of liquid and you would just add the pressures. <laughs> I like that. So, I mean, sometimes it, it really is as easy as this first example. I have four gases added to a closed container. Neon, at a pressure of three atmospheres, plus oxygen, at a pressure of 3.3 .3 atmospheres, plus nitrogen at 2.9, and hydrogen at 3.2. And I want to know the total uh, pressure exerted by the gases. It really is as easy as adding them up. Will there be a question like this on the next test? You betcha. Yeah, you just add. Uh, 3, 3.3, 3 2.9. Plus 3.2 is 12.4 atmospheres. It didn't matter the identity of the gas. 
It didn't matter if they were different gases. It could have been that I had four samples of neon in different containers and I add them all together. You can just add the pressure. It's based on the number of particles. The more particles, the more pressure. Interesting. Now you can also kind of do the reverse. Okay, so people kind of get a little tripped up on this next example, but actually I kind of like it. A mixture of two moles of hydrogen, three moles of ammonia, and four moles of carbon dioxide exert a total pressure of 600 kilopascal. What is the partial pressure of each gas? Okay, this partial pressure, partial pressure means like the individual pressure. And that's a V in there. Individual pressure from each gas. How much of that 600 kilopascal is coming from hydrogen? How much is coming from the ammonia? How much is coming from the carbon dioxide? It's kind of a reverse of this first one. In the first one, they gave us all the individual pressures, and we just had to add them up to get the total. This time, they tell us the total. And I want to know data that looks like this. How much pressure is coming from each individual gas? Now, when I add the pressures, and I add the particles in a closed container, whatever gas is contributing the most pressure must be the gas that has the most particles. I mean, we're talking about gases being at the same temperature and pressure. Ha <laughs> pressure. Well, dependent on number of particles. But they have to be at the same temperature for sure. So like in this first example, the 3.3, that's the pressure of the oxygen. I could tell you that once these gases are combined into this closed container, there must be the most particles coming from the oxygen. It's contributing the most pressure. So there must be the most collisions coming from oxygen, with hydrogen being a close second. Pressure is about collisions. And the collisions depend on the number of particles, not the identity of the particle. And now, sure, if I were like drastically changing the temperatures and maybe some particles are colliding more forcefully, I mean, if I had particles that had drastically different masses, maybe a more massive particle is colliding more forcefully. But I mean, these are all within reason. So that if one gas is contributing more pressure, it's because the number of particles is greater. There's more collisions coming from that particular gas. Okay, so here's what we're going to do to kind of work this thing backwards here. The amount of pressure coming from each gas that contributes to this total is dependent on the number of particles, which they're telling me the moles, and the moles is a unit that measures particles. So we're going to use something called mole fraction. It's kind of like a percentage. So for example, if I add these moles, I've got three, uh, two moles, three moles, and four moles. Seven, eight, nine. So there's nine total moles of gas. Here's what mole fraction looks like. Two moles of hydrogen out of nine moles total. So do you see how it's kind of like a percentage? Two out of nine, it's kind of like a percent. Like if I plug this in my calculator, two divided by nine, I get like 0.222 repeating. Like a little more than 20%. Now, if I wanted to make this a true percentage, I would multiply by 100. And then I'd say it's like, ah, oh, 22.2%. But we don't need the percentage, so we can kind of leave it as a fraction, which is why they call this mole fraction. Because now what I'm going to do anyways is multiply by the total pressure, the 600 kilopascal. So it's kind of like saying 22% of the particles are hydrogen, so 22% of the pressure is hydrogen. Which then if I did that calculation, I would use it as a decimal anyway. 
So we never really like officially turn it into a percentage, which is why they just call this mole fraction. Okay, so I'm going to multiply. 0.22222 times 600 is about 133. I don't know. I'll just say like three. There's really no indicator on. I like. I know the sig figs. I guess the 600 is three sig figs, but I think I'm just going to go ahead and leave one extra so that in the end I am a little more confident that if I add these up, I'm going to get 600. I don't want to round them too dramatically. Okay, so that's kilopascal. So that's like saying about 133 kilopascal is the pressure being contributed by the hydrogen molecule. Ah, you see there where this is going, right? Now we just do the same thing, but for each individual gas. Oh, so then I've got three moles of ammonia. And not that the, the formula matters, but ammonia is NH3 out of nine moles total. Okay, so now... It doesn't matter what the formulas are as long as they're telling me the moles. If they tried to step this up a notch, they could have given me grams. So if they said you have like two grams of hydrogen and three grams of ammonia, well, now I'd need to convert them to moles because the pressure is dependent on the number of particles. And the number of particles is measured by moles. Then if they gave me grams, I would need to know the formula of ammonia which somehow I would tell you. Okay, so three out of nine, that's a third. Or 0.333, repeating. But then, I mean, honestly, you could just kind of keep this going in your calculator because then I'm going to multiply that by my total pressure. So 33%, a third of the 600 should be 200. I'll say 0. Kilo Pascal, there's the pressure coming from the ammonia. About a third of the particles are ammonia, a third of the pressure is ammonia. And now at this point, you can use your noggin. I mean, these pressures need to add up to 600. So you could add the 200 plus the 133 and subtract them from 600. But for fun, you could plug in the last one. I've got four moles of carbon dioxide out of nine moles total. Four out of nine is like 0.444, repeating. So it's about 44% of the particles are carbon dioxide. So 44% of the collisions are carbon dioxide and 44% of the pressure is carbon dioxide. Or in other words, 266.7. And I like this. Because now if I add these bad boys, I should get the 600 total. Okay, so it's not a difficult calculation. But there's not like a formula. It's not necessarily plug and chug. You kind of have to use your noggin a little bit and understand the chemistry behind this. The pressure is dependent on the number of particles. So the fraction of the particles is the same as the fraction of the pressure. I kind of like that one. I think it's cute. Okay, so uh, one other thing that we can do with this Dalton's Law of Partial Pressure. Whoa, look at this picture. It's a pretty fancy setup, huh? Okay, so we're going to do a lab. Very, very, very similar to this. Uh, the setup here. They've got this big flask. The flask has zinc, zinc metal. And then up on top is hydrochloric acid. We have totally done this reaction. When zinc and hydrochloric react, they produce bubbles of hydrogen gas. So it's a closed container so that the hydrogen gas bubbles and we want to collect the gas. We want to know how much hydrogen gas is being collected. It's kind of tricky to actually collect and quantify or measure an amount of gas produced from a chemical reaction. 
because usually, I mean, like when we did this earlier in the year, we saw the bubbles of hydrogen and we tested it and the hydrogen popped and it was really awesome. But the hydrogen just dispersed into the air. We never collected it. And so here's a really great method. This is called gas collection. Gas collection by water displacement. Gas collection by water displacement. Great method of collecting gas and measuring the amount of gas. So we're going to have something kind of, kind of similar. Our setup is going to be a little more simple in the lab, actually. We're going to have this giant tube. It's kind of like a big graduated cylinder. We're going to fill it with water. And then we're going to flip it upside down into another container of tap water. So at the pressure of this water, we'll just hold the column of water up in our tube. This tube has markings or graduations so that I can measure the amount of hydrogen collected by its volume. Cool. So the hydrogen starts to form in this flask. Bubble, bubble, bubble. It bubbles into this tube. And then what do you know? The hydrogen starts to bubble and displace the water in my collecting tube. Ours, are, we're really going to use like big graduated cylinders upside down. And so eventually, these bubbles will push out the water so that on the top of this tube, I don't know, like maybe this much of it, this is the hydrogen. Or in general, this will be the gas. Whatever gas we're collecting will be up on the top. And then the rest of this tube would just be water. But because of these markings, I can measure the volume of gas collected. Pretty fancy, huh? We're going to use a butane lighter. We're going to take like a little butane lighter. Whoop, we'll take a little lighter. And we're going to put it underneath this big tube and just push the lever. And we're going to like bubble in a whole bunch of butane gas. And we'll measure the volume of the sample by using the markings on our upside down graduated cylinder. Fabulous. A 250 milliliter sample of hydrogen is collected over water at 19 degrees. So this tap water that was filling the tube and down in this little container, this flask or beaker, was 19 degrees. Inside the collection tube, there will be hydrogen gas. But there's also a little bit of water vapor. There's also always this tendency for some of the water in the liquid phase to evaporate. So up on top here, you think this is all hydrogen, and it is mostly hydrogen, but there will be a small amount of water vapor in there. Ah. Inside the collection tube, there will be hydrogen and water vapor, exerting a total pressure of 756 millimeters of mercury. If the pressure from the water is 15 millimeters mercury, what is the partial pressure from the hydrogen alone? This is the first calculation that we have to do in this lab. We have to correct for the fact that there's a little bit of water vapor that mixes in with our gas, the gas that we're intending to collect. Not a lot. And I can tell that because, I mean, the pressure of the water is only 15 millimeters mercury. The total pressure is like 756. So most of it is the hydrogen. But I only want the pressure of the hydrogen gas alone when I do my further calculations. So we're going to have something that looks like this. P total or pressure total equals pressure of the gas plus pressure from the water. This will happen anytime you collect a gas by water displacement, that there will be some water vapor that mixes in with your gas, and you're going to want to correct for that. So we always do this really simple calculation. They're telling us the total. Is this 756 millimeters of mercury? I want the pressure of the gas, which in this case is the hydrogen. And the pressure from the water is that 15. Oh my gosh, this is so easy. All I have to do is what? Subtract 
Duh, just sub subtract out the pressure from water. The remaining pressure is the gas that you intended to collect. Gosh, I love this. 741. I don't even need a calculator. But it's just a little different application of this Dalton's law of partial pressure. All right, if we knew the total and we knew like an individual pressure, we could solve for the pressure of a remaining gas. This is great. So we're going to need to get some data off of this chart when we go in the lab. So our situation will be very similar. A student collects 54.5 milliliters of oxygen by water displacement. So they're bubbling the oxygen gas into some kind of a container of water that has graduations or markings on it so that they could measure the volume. The temperature of the water is 18 degrees Celsius. And the total pressure inside the collection vessel is 110.8 kilopascal. What is the pressure or the partial pressure of the oxygen gas alone? Okay, so our setup, very similar. Total pressure is a combination of the pressure, this time it's oxygen, plus pressure from any remaining water vapor that's inside of this collection vessel. They don't come out and tell you this. We just have to kind of understand what's happening in this procedure, that when you collect a gas by water displacement, your total pressure will be a combination of your oxygen plus a little bit of water. In the lab, we will have a, met a method of determining the total pressure. So we'll know the total pressure. In this case, 110.80. And it could be any unit, kilopascal, millimeters mercury, atmospheres. I want the pressure of the oxygen gas alone. Water vapor pressures are constant, depending on the temperature of the water. So you just look them up on a chart. Now, the previous example, they just told us it was 15, 15 millimeters mercury. We're going to use this chart in the lab. All we need to know is the water temperature, and then we can look up the corresponding vapor pressure. So even though they don't like come out and tell me that in the problem, we can look it up. So the what, water is 18 degrees. So 18 degrees, boom. Here's my vapor pressure of the water, 2.06 kilopascal. I love it. And now all we need to do is subtract. So I'm going to take that 110.8 and subtract off the water, 2.06, so that the pressure of my oxygen gas alone is 108.74 kilopascals. Piece of cake. These gas laws are so great. They make sense. If you combine any fluid, gases, liquids, the total pressure is just a combination of all the individual pressures. The total pressure is dependent on the number of particles. So by far, most of the particles are oxygen. There's just a small amount of water, liquid water, that will evaporate and form this vapor pressure. And all we got to do is subtract it up. 